Hey all, Blake here, and we are back doing some more machine learning with Unity. And this week we're going to really ramp it up and make the problem a lot more difficult. Um, <clears throat> now, I had originally approached this problem and I tried to do the entire thing at once and I actually spent hours and hours and hours trying to debug it and I never really got it to work right. This is one of those cases where, especially when you're doing machine learning and you're starting out, you really need to start very simple and start building and building and building on top of it because that's going to really give you a good intuition about what information it needs to go into these machine learning algorithms as you develop them. So <clears throat> the last uh, session, episode, whatever you want to call it, last video, we had gone from a single uh, instance of the game to training 20 instances of the game all at once. And this provided a huge speed up in the amount of uh, training that we're able to do in any given amount of time. And you can see the output of that behavior here. And there's this very smooth transition, uh, you know, from the starting point as the, the cursor goes to the end, right? And that's exactly what we had last time. So. Now what I'm doing is I've said, all right, I like this and I'm getting the right, uh, get, getting the right general concept down. Now I want to start making it feel more real. If you're going to be using this in games, if you're going to use this as kind of an animation system or something like that, you want it to have gravity and weight and uh, a believable motion. And one of the ways to do that is to literally give it gravity and weight. And that's to introduce physics into the equation. Now, when you start using the physics engine in Unity, one of the things that happens is your problem that your machine learning agents are trying to solve starts getting a whole lot more difficult very, very quickly because now there are external forces acting on the system. It's not a closed system where it has absolute complete control, complete knowledge of what's going on. In this case, we can give it complete knowledge, but it still doesn't have complete control because we're going to have gravity pulling our markers down and, we, and our system is going to want to balance that and have them come up. So <clears throat> I have the scene here and I have everything trained up. So I just want to show it to you while it works here. And so I'm going to hit play. So very similar to what we had before, you'll notice a few things, especially if we zoom in on the camera a little bit, um, is we'll zoom in on a couple of these. Here we go. Uh, first of all, the boxes, they don't hover cover the target completely, right? The next thing you'll notice, you'll see a little bit of shaking Right, and again, that's because the system is trying to maintain equilibrium. So the program in this case is continuous space. It can choose anything between um, negative one, which is actually use your thruster and go down, to one, which is use your thruster and go up the maximum amount. And so anywhere between those. <clears throat> and it's constantly firing and trying to find a, a spot close to the, the target where it will get a reward. The other thing you'll notice when it starts off, um, many of these drop down below it and then come back up. Because again, they're exerting force like they have a, a rocket thruster, that kind of thing. And so they don't just ease right onto the target. Now, in some cases, they might learn to do that. Um, mine have not learned to do that, and I don't think they will. Um, this is, seems to be good enough. Um, and so I don't think they're going to get a whole lot more reward to, to ease into it. And maybe this is actually more efficient um, to actually drop under it and fire a thruster and, and balance up a little bit. I'm not sure. But you'll see how they drop under and then come back up and, the, and they're reacting to it. And that's actually kind of a really great thing to see um, because what that does is, is provides, again, some of that believability and weight to, to their motion. And so as we start adding more complexity... Um, it becomes uh, pretty cool. The other thing is, well, so we can, you know, play around with moving the target around and seeing where it goes. Um, again, we have right now the animation limited to 250 steps, I think it is. And we can, you know, change that so it's not unbounded, so it doesn't automatically reset. And then we can start moving things around dynamically and starts getting really cool. So how to do this. All right. First thing we need to do 
I'm going to go ahead and just turn off the game creator and fire up, just have my single gravity game. Uh, camera is the same, directional light is the same. The Academy um, is slightly different. Actually, the Academy is the same, the brain is slightly different. We'll go into what that is in a second. Um, so here in the gravity game, we will see we're still using this generic brain. Um, we reset undone, the marker, target, that's the same. Starting a height, minimum, maximum, again, these are randomized position. Where does the target start? Where does the marker start? So negative five to five. Instead of uh, speed, we have an up force. So the up force in this case, this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when the, for every step, anytime the action happens, how much force do we add using the um, physics, the unity physics add force command? And I'll show you that in a second. And then again, the distance to earn rewards and on marker points. So how far away should we be to the marker to actually earn something? And then how many points do we earn? And we've left those untouched. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna open up that script in the background. While we do that, we're gonna take a look at the marker. Excuse me. Um, the only thing different about the marker is that it has a rigid body, right? So it's cube, box, collider, mesh render, and we added a rigid body. And by adding a rigid body, we have told Unity that this object is subject to physics interactions. And so we left uh, use gravity on. That's the default is that gravity affects an object. So we left that on, and that's what makes the object fall through um fall through the scene. So if, for example, we turned off the gravity agent, right, now we don't have any forces acting on it and it should just fall down, kerplunk, um, and it'll fall for eternity. So our gravity agent is adding a force to push it back up as gravity is pulling it down. The target is unchanged. So um, there are different ways that we could detect whether we're close enough when we want to provide reward or not. Um, in this case, I'm doing just a simple distance calculation. I'm not bothering with colliders or triggers. I certainly could, but um, there was no need for this simple example. So the target is, uh, I believe, unchanged uh, from the previous version, from the multi-training version. Now, let's go into some code. Um, so the gravity agent, this is the main thing that we're really concerned with here. Um, so again... Uh, up force, now you'll notice in Unity it's 20, and my default of 0.02 was certainly uh, off by just a touch, right? And this is uh, where you just have to experiment with it and play around with it. Oh, and again, one of the things that you need to do anytime you're doing this, um, <clears throat> switch that internal, the brain type over to player and make sure that you can play the game. You don't have to play it well, right? So this is me playing the game, and in this case, um, I only am using the keyboard for a binary, one or zero. Um, I could uh, bind this to a joystick so I get continuous input, um, but the idea is that you are able to play the game as a player so that you know that the computer will at least be able to play the game somewhat. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so by playing the game myself, that's what gave me a good idea of what I needed that up force to be really. So this was my first guess, which is a terrible default. Um, the actual up force I think is 20. Um, and again, distance turn reward and on marker points is unchanged. Uh, this is a rigid body. So this is uh, just my in my code. I do a git component once because git components are kind of uh, time intensive in theory. Um, so I just cache this reference to the rigid body so I always have it handy. Um, all right, so now we start getting into some of the changes. Before, when the system reset and a new game started, we would just deal with the marker position and the target position, and we would randomly place those. Now, because we've added physics and we're not destroying and creating new uh, markers and targets, what would happen, and what did happen until I added this code, um, is it will maintain the physics state. So the physics velocity, physics rotations are going to uh, maintain between every one of the programs. So it's super important um, that, you know, if you have a rigid body that you set your velocity to zero and set your rotation back to identity so that you reset the physics portion of it 
Otherwise, what will happen is you'll be able to play the first game, but then the second game comes along, or any time that you get you know, a high velocity, it'll just uh, keep going and going, and you'll wonder why your game isn't working, and that's probably because physics needs to get reset. So that's pretty important. Because we're getting those external forces acting on it, we need to inform the system of what the, in this case, the y velocity, because we're just worried about gravity, um, we need to inform it what those forces are. In theory, you could have a machine learning system with enough neurons um, kind of figure this out over time, that it would be able to calculate what that velocity is based on the you know previous positions and whatnot. The issue with that is that, one, it's adding needless complexity, right? It's easy to give it this information. And the second is um, we don't necessarily know how much time, how much training, how many neurons, and how much memory are gonna be needed to calculate that kind of thing. So in this case, you can try to go for that kind of thing. I find, generally speaking, there isn't any real benefit. In fact, if you can provide it with information quickly and easily, you absolutely should. And it's better to err on the side of too much information as opposed to not enough information. So having this uh, velocity value in there gives us a second piece of information about the state of the system, and that's very important for training. And then upon agent step, uh, we are very similar. The only difference is then we have our action y, and instead of um, adding a speed based on action y, we are actually uh, imp imparting a force on it, right? We're adding a force um, in the direction and at the magnitude uh, requested. And then once again, if we're close enough, we add points. All right, let's see here. So that's pretty much it. Now, if we go back to the scene, take a look at our brain. Our state size is now two. One of these is position, right? How far are we from the target? And the second one is what is our current y velocity? So those are the two pieces of information that we're providing our system. And the action size is still one. How much up or down force are we providing anywhere between negative 20 and 20 based on uh, the value here, right? So negative one and one multiplied by that force, which gives us negative 20 and 20. Training for this is quite a bit different um, than the training in the previous cases. Again, by adding that external force, we need a lot more information, double the information to be able to uh, uh, learn properly, and then we also need a whole heck of a lot more training time. Um, I had to go through, uh, I think it was three or four passes uh, before I found a set of hyperparameters that got me what I was looking for. Um, some of the earlier, the, the previous hyperparameters that I had used uh, turned out to be too uh, too chaotic, the system wouldn't converge on good value. So I wanna show you, here is TensorBoard. So this is um, the internal metrics tool. So you can see here's our PPO and we can go through and see the exact moment at which it really learned what the heck it was doing, right? So we have a bunch of you know, super low scores, and then it got a little better, and then, you know, a bit better, and then all of a sudden we jumped from 2 to 12, almost 13, and then 20 and 18, and then it refined it from there, right? And it's okay to go through those numbers, but the graphs really do make it nice to see. Now, again, that jump happened around the 100,000 iteration mark. The previous time that we trained this, when we had all 20 samples going on at once, we, I think, had a maximum of 10,000 iterations, something like that. So we can actually, again, with the tensor board, when you change in your hyperparameters, when you change this um, run path, um, this is actually where it saves the statistics. So every time you change the run path, you get a new graph. And so we can compare this with some of these earlier things we did. So with pass one, right, that's our simplest scenario, our very first um, version that was with the single environment, right? And then this is how it learned, and it looks like that was over 50,000 iterations, right? And then if we compare that with uh, simplest scenario multi pass two, so this is the one that I did live, right? Where 
Yeah, it was just a couple thousand, iter- 10,000 iterations, and it went from zero to almost 24, zero to fully trained in 10,000 iterations. This didn't do that at all. You can see how it starts really slow, and then all of a sudden something happens, boom, that uh, reward shoots up, and then it refines it from there. Um, so in this case, I had plotted it out to 500,000 iterations, half a million iterations, because I had no idea if or when it was going to uh, really learn. I also didn't know if it was going to be uh, slow or quick learning once it actually found it. I suspected it was going to be quick because this problem is so simple, Um, but these graphs are uh, really a telltale sign. They'll they'll really give you some useful information about what's going on. Um, In conjunction with that um, in Unity, and I've included a link um, in, uh, I'll include a link in the notes and then I'll also include a link in the source um, here in common. This is just my link over to the Unity ML best practices with training uh, with PPO. This goes into all the hyperparameters, what its expected values are and when to use uh, which range of values. It's not going to know when to use what value exactly, but if it says, hey, you know, if your uh, training doesn't seem to be stable, you could try increasing this number or decreasing this number. So I will put these new hyperparameters in a text file that goes along with uh, this folder just so that everybody can see what those are. Um, and we can start building up uh, some kind of information um, about what parameters are good with what kinds of scenarios as we build these out. So here you are. Um, I just want to make this available. I'll put it on the GitHub and uh, that way you'll be able to see this, play around with it. And then we're going to keep making this more and more complex, adding things to it, um, including uh, doing various things to start making some of these Uh, movements and and motions believable and usable in some kind of game. So if you have any questions, thoughts, uh, please feel free to leave a comment and I'll try to uh, reply to any questions or anything as best I can. Thank you and good luck out there.